Good morning. We're having a sort of Scottish theme today, but it's the first in Advent, so we're just bringing out the Advent candles. No, it's all right. It's all right. Um, Perfect. Thank you. That's brilliant. It'd be really nice if Andy, don't you disappear? Could you find the lighter and maybe direct a young person? We need a volunteer to light the first candle. There, there was a lighter at the communion table, or used to be a lighter at the com- See, nobody carries. Oh, there we go. There we go. Do we have somebody? He's too young. No, but there's. <laughs> would, would, you, would you like. Or, you know, Denia, if you don't want to. Perfect. There we go. Is this. We just direct Andy's hand. <laughs> Anybody got a couple of sticks? <laughs> is is that is that you know the, it's there? See the blue handle? No, in the middle. In the middle. Go right. That's why the church has ministers, by the way. (laughs) Thank you. Well done. And just, just, just in case there are people who don't know what is represented by the first candle. What does the first candle represent? Beginning of Advent. Hope, shouting out here. And that's going to fit in with our theme today. So, I'm going to, I don't think I've got any intimations other than to remind the elders that we have a Kirk session here on Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock in next door. Is that right? Yeah. Um, And I'm going to ask uh, Judith to say a few words on the little light bearers, just to let everyone know what's, what's happening. Good morning. Well, I've actually come along completely unprepared because Wayne's just asked me to do this. Um, But you've maybe noticed the poster that was on display there. Um, The Little Light Bearers is an initiative that actually is from one of the parents that comes along to our uh, services here. Um, And uh, it will start in December. The idea is that we would like to um, really give a little bit more Christian teaching to the children of our community. Uh, and in a fun way. So it's an after school club um, and they'll come along, get a bit of snack, have a bit of time to run around, um, uh, watch a bit of DVD and uh, activities, crafts, games, just everything to sort of focus um, the message. Christmas is a great time to start because everybody thinks they know the Christmas story, but um, I think as we unpack it this this, uh, December, it will be interesting to see what the children know, what we as adults know, and actually what the Bible tells us. So um, if anybody does know any children in the community that don't go to Edsel or Castro School, there's one or two registration forms at the door. And um, really, if anybody wants any more information, you can speak to me or Heather Douglas and anybody, Alison, <laughs> there's loads of helpers that have come forward. But if you do think that you've got a, a skill and want to be involved with the children in our community, do speak to me because we're always needing helpers and we're quite delighted to get people on a rota for carrying it forward into the, into the new year. Okay, thanks. Thank you, thank you, that's perfect. And this Sunday, we're, we've, we've got a sort of Scottish theme running through the service, at least with the music, with the hymns. But it's also a special occasion, for it marks Thomas's baptism. And it's, it's great to say a special welcome um, to Stephen and Diane's family and friends who have gathered uh, with us for this special occasion. 
And Thomas has been brilliant. We've had a conversation going now for a few weeks, so we're, we're hoping and praying that it will continue today. Let us worship God. Let us sing to his praise. We're going to sing a well-known hymn, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say, Come Unto Me. And it's to the well-known Scottish tune, The Rowan Tree. Jesus say, come on to me and rest. Lay down the weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, weary and worn and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give the living water, thirsty one, stoop down and drink and live. I came to Jesus and I drank of that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in Him. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me, thy morn shall rise, and all thy day be bright. I looked to Jesus, and I found in him my star, my sun. And in that light of life I'll walk Till travelling days are done I looked to Jesus and I found In Him my star, my sun And in that light of life I'll walk Till travelling days are Let us come before God in prayer. Let us bow our heads. Our great and gracious God, we gather before you in the beauty of holiness to offer to you our sacrifice of praise as those edified and encouraged through the ministry of word and sacrament. Make your presence known to us thereby and minister to each as each has need. We come to the Father in and through the Son by the Spirit and paraphrasing the psalmist, we say, we have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. Our lips will praise you, so we will bless you as long as we live. In your name we will lift up our hands. 
receive our freewill offerings along with our worship. Take them and use us for the furtherance of Christ's kingdom of love, here, near, and far. Father, forgive us our trespasses and transgressions for Jesus' sake, who died for our sin and who rose again to make us righteous. Grant us grace to keep your commandments, to walk before you and one another in love, which is the summation of your holy law. Help us demonstrate that we are new creations by the means of grace and by the work of the Spirit who indwells us. Lord, bless us as your church gathered in this place. We especially pray for Thomas, who is to be baptized, his parents, Stephen and Diane, and their family and friends who have joined us for this special occasion. We remember your people meeting elsewhere throughout Angus as well, our nation and to the ends of the earth. May your church fulfill her calling. May we be a beacon to faith, hope, and love in a world of such great need. Bless our families and our friends, our neighbors, and all who contribute to the well-being of our communities. Be with us in this Advent season as we prepare for Christmas and the new year and a fresh chapter for your church in these parts. We ask your blessing on the little light bearers after school club, which will begin in the church hall next month. But be with the organizers, the helpers, and all the children who will participate. In a time of change and uncertainty, you, O oh God, do not change. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are the rock, our place of refuge, in whom we find strength and stability and security. We ask that you would heal the sick, that you might comfort the bereaved, calm those that are anxious, Restore that which is lost. Strengthen those who are weak. Protect the vulnerable. Provide for the poor. Shelter the homeless. Prosper all in Jesus' name, who taught us to say together, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, before we come to the baptism, we've been working our way through the Apostles' Creed. And it's particularly, I thought we should keep that going simply because today we, I will ask you shortly to say uh, affirm the Apostles' Creed with me. We're at, we've reached Article 11, which simply refers to the resurrection of the body. The Apostles' Creed, based upon the teaching of the Bible, teaches us that the resurrection of the body is integral to the Christian faith. It's not a peripheral issue, it's something that is that is very much part of the good news that we have to believe and to share with others. Christ has come that we might have life, have it abundantly in the here and now, but also we have the promise of it eternally and not merely as disembodied spirits or souls, but wholly human, physical as well as spiritual. The Apostles' Creed teaches a bodily resurrection, hence, in addition to the spiritual one that is referred to by theologians by such terms as uh, regeneration, to be born again and stuff. When the Spirit indwells us, we are said to become new creations. And then, of course, there is, and it's, it's not always understood, even by Christians in the church, because it's not always taught as well as it might be. But the Christian faith is, is that the body will one day be reunited with the soul. So at death, what happens? There is a separation of the body and the soul. The soul, the spirit, goes to be with the Lord in heaven. I'm sometimes asked um, at I've been asked, let's say, in the past at funerals, 
to read a poem. And it's a well-known poem, but it's a poem that I always decline to read. And I explain why I don't feel able to read it. But I do suggest that if a family member or a friend wanted to read it, I'm quite happy for them to read it, if that's their view. So I'm not imposing my position, but as a Christian minister, it's that one, I st don't, gr don't weep for me, I'm not here, I'm in the trees, I'm in such and such. That is, that, that is not really the teaching of the Bible. We, have no, we know where we're going. We know who has us in his hands. We're not merely floating around as spirit after our death, but we are with the Lord, although we are spirit and hence confined to any one place, but we are with the Lord in glory, but we look for the resurrection of the body at that time of that, when Christ comes and he gathers his people and leads us in triumphal procession. It'll be a time of great reunions. We shall know one another. We shall see one another. And we shall fulfill God's promises. We shall, we shall epitomize the fullness of our humanity. Because we will be like Christ. We were made in the image and likeness of God originally. And that image was sullied and soiled by sin through the fall, the Bible says. But Jesus came in order to restore that image. And just as Christ's resurrection body was somewhat different, so will ours, and we shall be perfect, as he is perfect. That's the teaching of the Bible. So the Apostles' Creed teaches implicitly, thereby the final eternal state, not merely the intermediate state, but the final state, which is the eternal state, which the church proclaims through her creeds on the basis of the sacred scriptures. And just a couple of proof texts. Very often at a funeral service at the graveside, I will read from 1 Corinthians 15, nearly always do. And here's a couple of verses from the passage that I read. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And again from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The resurrection is very much integral to our Christian faith. Well, we're going to, as I was saying earlier, it's a joyous occasion, a special occasion. And we're going to read, for, I'm going to read first of all, the words of institution. Why do we baptize? Well, the Lord Jesus tells us to baptize just as he instituted the Lord's Supper for his church. Similarly, he has given us the sacrament of baptism. I'm going to read the words as they are found in Matthew's Gospel, um, chapter 28. I'm reading from verse 16 to the end of the chapter. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, I'm going to invite the congregation to be upstanding so that we can affirm our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. If you're looking, if you need the hymnal, it's on, it's 628, 628 in the hymnal. But we shall, we shall say the creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Can I ask the congregation to be uh, seated? Uh, the baptismal party can remain standing. When Jesus was baptized in the waters of the River Jordan, the Spirit of God came upon him. His baptism was completed through his dying and rising again. Our baptism is a sign of our dying to sin and rising to new life in Jesus Christ. It is Christ himself who baptizes us by the Spirit of Pentecost. He makes us members of his body the church and calls us to share in his ministry in the world. By water and the Holy Spirit, God claims us as his own. He washes us from sin and sets us free from the power of death. In the sacrament, the love of God is offered to each one of us. Though we cannot comprehend it or explain it fully, we are called to accept that love with the openness and trust of a little child like Thomas. In baptism, Thomas is assured of the love that God has for him, and the sign and seal of the Holy Spirit is placed upon him. And to Stephen and Diane, do you promise, depending on the grace of God, to teach this child the truths and duties of the Christian faith, and by prayer and example, so bring him up in the life and worship of the church? In presenting this child for baptizing, desiring that he may be incorporated into Christ as a member of his body, the church, do you receive the teaching of the Christian faith, which we confess together in the Apostles' Creed? Let us, let us give thanks to God. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for all that he has done for us. And we thank you for the sacrament of baptism which he instituted as a sign and seal of your promises to us. We ask your rich blessing be upon Thomas and upon his parents, Stephen and Diane. We pray too for their families and, uh, their families and friends gathered with us for this joyous occasion. And we pray that we might each have occasion to reflect upon the significance of our own baptism. May your grace and your glory rest upon Thomas and all of us, now and forevermore. Amen. For Thomas, Jesus Christ came into this world. He lived and displayed God's love. He suffered the darkness of Calvary and cried at the last, it is finished. For Thomas, he triumphed over death and rose again to newness of life. He ascended to reign at God's right hand. All this he did for Thomas, though he does not yet fully or cannot know it. And so the scripture is fulfilled. We love because he first loved us.
screen and uh, we'll take our lead from the choir. Thomas belongs to God in Christ, and from this day he will be at home in the church. There will always be a place for him. Tell him of his baptism and unfold to him the treasures that has been given to him today so that he may know that he is baptized and belongs to Christ. And as he grows, may he make his own response in faith and love. Let us nurture one another in faith, let us uphold one another in prayer. Let us encourage one another in worship, in the works, in the witness of the church. I'm going to invite our session clerk, Andy, is going to make a short presentation. Thank you. God bless. Well, we're going to sing again a um, well-known hymn. It was chosen by Stephen and Diane for today. Be still for the presence of the Lord. The Holy One is here.
everlasting. Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing to that reading of his word. Did this just come on and in? Yes. <laughs> My fault. Okay, sorry. All right. You were expecting it would be on for that, of course. Okay. Well, we're going to sing once again. It's a well-known hymn. It's Psalm 23, but we're going to sing it to the bays of Harris. I was once telling you about um, the church in Scarista. I took a wedding there, and we had a harpist playing the tune in the bays of Harris to the 23rd Psalm. I was also once conducting a funeral in Skye in Portree. Um, I went back to take a funeral and um, I had to present the 23rd Psalm to this tune. And I looked down and for those of you who are, are visitors, you know, I'm more like a crow than a canary. And I looked down and the fourth, the fourth row up was Donny Monroe of Runrig. I couldn't believe it. I was like, there, I'm trying to sing this song. But it's a beautiful, beautiful tune. I think it was the tune that Karen Matheson sang at Her Majesty's funeral service in St. Giles Cathedral. Uh, again, to the harp. We don't have a harp, but the music will have been. And we've got a picture. It's not the Bay of Harris you'll see, but God's own country. I'll let you guess what that is.
Well, we return to the passage of Scripture, which you may or may not have heard me reading a few moments ago. I hope you heard it. Um, We're not going to take a particular verse, but I'm going to refer to, to parts of the psalm throughout. Our theme today is God with us. And while it's always appropriate to explore such a subject, it seems most apposite this Sunday in particular. For today, Thomas's parents took hold of God's promise, signed and sealed in the sacrament of baptism, to be with Thomas always. Similarly, today is the first Sunday in Advent, which eagerly anticipates the, the coming of the living God into our world in the person of his only begotten Son, who was born to the Virgin, to become the Lord and Savior of the world. And this Sunday, we commemorate and celebrate, too, St. Andrew's Day, which is on Wednesday coming. St. Andrew, as you know, was one of the twelve personally called out to be apostles by the Lord Jesus Christ. It was Andrew who introduced his brother Peter to the Lord, come and see. And he provides us with a great example. We are merely to tell others, come and see, pointing them to Jesus. Venerated after his death, tradition tells us that St. Regulus or Rule, responding to an angelic vision which told him to have the saint's bones taken to the known extremities of the world at that time. Well, he got on a boat, and the boat eventually was beached on the shores of Fife at a place called Kilramont. And there a little chapel was built to house the bones of the saint, or some of the bones of the saint. And that place was later renamed St. Andrews in his memory. And there's also, of course, a memorial in the shape of the, the tower that still stands next to the ruin, the ruin of the cathedral that was dedicated to St. Regulus. It was this firm conviction that God is with us in Jesus Christ that compelled St. Andrew to step out in the Great Commission. It was that same faith that compelled St. Regulus and others to act, to go into all the world and share the good news, make Christ known, see his church planted and grow. And in recent times, we've considered some such figures. We visited Ochen Blay and St. Palladius's chapel and heard about the history of how Palladius was sent from Rome, first to Ireland and then to here, to this region of Scotland. We've considered Columba in the past and how in that leap of faith that took him over the Irish Sea to plant a church at Iona and with him a man called Droston who would be responsible for the, for the priory and then the abbey at Deer, New Deer up in Aberdeenshire, but who retired to this region, lived a hermetic lifestyle in the Glen, which became again a pilgrimage, a place of pilgrimage to visit the ruins where Druston once called upon the name of the Lord and where people visited him. And then, of course, just a few weeks ago, we visited Rusteneth Priory. And I was telling you the history of the priory. And before it was a priory, it was a church established in the year 710. When King Necton of the Picts wrote to the monks at Wearmouth and Yarrow. Jarrow, and they, they sent St. Boniface to establish this church, which was dedicated to Andrew's brother. St. Peter reminding us of the, the Catholicity, the oneness of the church and our common faith. But these, these men and others, countless others, men and women since, it was this belief that God is with them. He is with us 
in Christ and will provide for our needs that gave and continues to give us the confidence, the comfort, the cheer that whatever confronts us in life, he will never abandon us. He will never forsake us and he will fulfill every one of his promises to us for the promises to you and to your children. Consider therefore God is always present. That's what the psalmist wants us to understand. He is omnipresent. We read, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. You're all familiar with the story of Jonah. Poor Jonah thought that he could flee from the presence of God. <coughs> Jonah, God said to Jonah, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and proclaim good news to the folks there. But Jonah thought, no, I'm not going to do that. And he went off in the opposite direction, as far as he could possibly go at that time, to the coast of Spain, to a place called Tarshish. But he discovered that he could not escape God's presence. When I was a, a toddler, possibly, I'm not sure exactly the date, many of you will know. But I'm, I've seen footage since and read things. But remember the Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Yagarin, an atheist. And he couldn't help when he got into outer space. To make this mocking comment, God is not here. <laughs> As if he could see spirit. Maybe he was on spirits, I don't know. But what was he expecting to find? And then we live and move and have our being. And he's away, he's over and above creation, but he's also in it, involved in it intimately. God, the psalmist is reminding us, is with us everywhere. There's nowhere we can be where he is not with us. Which ought to give us confidence and comfort us. God is with us moreover enduringly. No matter what we go through. Very often it's not that God forsakes us. But we sometimes turn our back on him. Or we forget him and so on. But he's there. He's with us. He's not far from any of us. The Bible says. Call upon him, for he is near to you. And we have that promise. God is with us, moreover, emphatically in and through Jesus Christ. Emmanuel, God with us, God for us, more importantly, God in us by his Spirit, symbolized in the sacrament of baptism. Today. Another great Scotsman, often claimed by the Welsh, he's no Welsh, <laughs> you're not having him, but he was a Briton, uh, a Roman Briton, and so the Britons were Strathclyde and down the west coast of Scotland all the way into Wales, so, and they spoke the same language, uh, and so Scots and the Welsh claim St. Patrick as their own. St. Patrick was a man who was kidnapped, sold into slavery, taken off to Ireland. But he never gave, turned his back on God and God used him mightily. He became a bishop in the church. He led so many people to Christ. They found good news through the ministry of this man. And we see the hand of providence at work in such events. God was with them. God took them there. God upheld them and supported them and strengthened them. And of course, he was after Palladius. He wrote, well, there's a hymn attributed to him. We sometimes sing. We're not singing it today, but the words are so, so important or so a great reminder to us of what we are look, considering today. He wrote, Christ beside me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, 
King of my heart, Christ within me, Christ below me, Christ above me, never to part. There's Emmanuel, who we celebrate, eagerly anticipate and long for in the Advent season. God, moreover, is not only omnipresent, but he's omniscient. He's, in other words, he's all-knowing and all-seeing, the Bible teaches. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. I cannot attain it. The Bible assures us that God foreloved us. He knew us before we were born. Our names are written in his book of life. He planned and purposed our lives. He knows the end from the beginning. And he keeps loving us. God fashions our lives. He's not a God who is merely transcendent. There are some religions which have this very high view of God, rightly so, but they forget the intimacy of God, whom we've come to know in Jesus and we've come to know the Father through the Spirit. He's with us. He loves us. He cares for us. He guides us. He directs us. He fashions our lives. And very often, it's only, providence is a really difficult map to, to read. Better stick into the Bible, following Christ. But we can see very often when we look back how God was directing us. How his hand was upon us. How he made provision at just the right times. How he answers our prayers. Not only in ways that we want or expect. But we can look back and say, thank you, Lord. He is with us and for us. God faithfully, moreover, fulfills his promises to us. Great, the Bible says, is his faithfulness. The promise is for you and for your children. And, you know, that's why we can say that God has given us a future and a hope. And that's what we celebrate at Advent. And that first candle represents hope. God appoints a day, moreover, for our entry into this world and another from, for our departure from it. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the hidden uh, depths of the earth, rather. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. The psalmist is reminding us that God, to praise God as our creator, that he made us. We understand the science. Some of us have possibly studied it. Of conception and how a child grows from an embryo and so on. But God is our creator. He is our maker. And we should worship him as such. And he made all things, but he made man, male and female, unique. He made us in his image and likeness. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's why God himself was made in the image and likeness of man to put aright what has been put amiss through the fall. And hence the washing of baptism and so on and the incorporation into Christ, union with Christ, symbolized therein. Let us praise God, not only as our creator, but as our carer, as our benefactor, as the one who seeks our good, our blessing. That's why we were singing together the words of the blessing. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, etc. He's the one that we have come to know in Jesus. 
Let us praise God who came among us in the person of the only begotten, who took our nature to himself to restore that image. God, moreover, apportions gifts and graces. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Well, there's nothing that God doesn't know. And so while he sends us into this life, he also, as I was saying, he appoints a day for our departure from it. I've always struggled with this or some aspects of it. I remember reading a great Scottish Presbyterian of the 17th century called um, Samuel Rutherford. Interestingly, Rutherford found his prison cell to be his promised land because he was so conscious of the presence of God there, a bit like Bunyan in his prison cell. Rutherford fell foul of the, of the crown who, were, who had brought in a different form of church government brought in bishops in the 17th century and Rutherford was a tired Presbyterian so James II, more his son Charles I had him in prison well through the church he couldn't accept the Laudian changes and stuff so he was imprisoned up in Aberdeen that's where they sent folk who were bad in the past Aberdeen if you've ever been to Petrodry you don't you know any different so but Rutherford I remember reading years ago he, he had to bury something like 10 of his children. A high percentage. Life expectancy was not what it is today. And infant mortality was a very real danger and threat. And he wrote this, I, I, I can't remember his exact words, but it meant so much at the time that sometimes he says, God plucks the finest blossoms and blooms from the plant. He knows exactly when they're ripe and ready and, one, and I'll see them again. You know, and I just thought, wow. But in the face of death, he understood that God is the God of life and he will never forsake us. And so while death marks a separation, it's not the end. It, there is a continuation because we believe in the God of life. But God apportions also gifts and graces. He calls us to faith. For he asks us to believe in him. To trust in him. And he, he, he's revealed what that faith is in him. In Jesus Christ. And God commands our faithfulness. He says come follow me. I heard the voice of Jesus say. Come unto me. And he says not only rest but follow me. God is calling us. To keep his commandments for love's sake. They're the way of love. He wants us to live that more excellent way. To make a difference in the here and now. God commissions us to be fruitful. And so some of these saints that I mentioned. They went out into the world. But we, we start in our, in our families. Amongst our friends. In our own communities. Sharing and living out good news. In order that the Lord... Maybe using us as the, the person who opens a door to welcome someone into the body of Christ. And to be fruitful means to, to bear certain fruits, the fruits of the Spirit. So what does he want to see in our lives? But love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control and so on. And he grants us these things through his Spirit. He doesn't command us and leave us to our own devices. He commands and he gives what he commands. <coughs> Finally, let us therefore admire and adore our God. How precious to me are your thoughts. O oh God, how vast is the sum of them. Let us read both books of Revelation in order to truly admire and adore the living God. The heavens declare the glory of God. All around us we see his handiwork and we see it most perfectly in in you and I, made in the image and likeness of God. You know, I watched, we had remembrance service recently, but on Friday night, I watched that 
the graphic, the bloody, the brutal, the, the horrific depiction that is the modern version of the film All Quiet on the Western Front. I'd certainly recommend it, but it's not an easy watch. And you know, you just think to yourself, why, Lord, all these young men? And I'm presently reading a book on a chap who, who did a, a, almost like a pilgrimage. He's walking the whole Western Front. And it's young. He's talking about the graves. Young boys. That's what they are. Slaughtered. Needlessly on both sides. The stupidity. Because we're equally made in the image and likeness of God. Of infinite worth. Let us admire God. And let us, let us see that in one another. The image and likeness. But also let us read special revelation, his word, which reveals the word incarnate, that we might follow him and learn to live in peace and love and joy. Let us reflect on what God's revelation teaches us about God and our relationship to him. That one that's rooted and built up in love. Realizing what we are called to be. Fulfilling our potential, our purpose, by God's grace. Let us rejoice in God the Father through the Son, by the Spirit. <coughs> Jesus came to reveal the Father and to demonstrate the extent of his infinite love towards us. Let us reciprocate. Why? Because God is with us now and forevermore. Well, may he himself add his blessing to these few thoughts. Amen. We're going to sing. No, we're not. We're going to Somebody's going to pray, I hope. And he's going to lead us in prayer. <coughs> Let us join together in prayer. <coughs> Loving God, for every good meal we have shared this week, for every kind word we have received, for every good book on our shelves, for every good idea in our heads, for every positive message received, we offer our thanks. For the gardens that rest, for nights of good company, for this time of Advent, for inspiring speeches and positive writing, for clothes that fit, for the wisdom of age and the smiles of children, we offer our thanks. For those who teach and nurture us and our children, for thoughts which have helped and restored us, for friends who have listened to us and stayed alongside, for the work of your spirit in our lives and in the lives of others, we offer you, gracious God, praise and thanks now and always. Today, we are glad for those who have had good news, including the baptism of Thomas. For those recovering from illness, for those discovering new friends and new ideas, for all who with us rejoice in Advent as a season of hope and good cheer, here at home, throughout our nation and across the world. We remember those for whom Advent is a difficult time, those on their own, those bereaved, those with difficult memories those anxious about the stresses of the Christmas season and those distant from families and friends. We pray for those who are cold and hungry because of fuel poverty and all who seek to help them. We pray for the sick in body and mind, for the lonely and the fearful, for those experiencing poverty and financial hardship in these difficult times. We pray for those who lead our, our nations, for members of our parliaments, for councillors, for governments at home and abroad, and for all who have the power to make a difference in people's lives. We join a great company around the world who seek peace and justice and long for a kinder world. Be with us now and all whom we love as we move into the final month of an eventful year. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We bring our service of worship to a conclusion by singing.
from Psalm 139. It's a modern rendition. We've sang it a couple of times before. You know it well. It's a real foot tapper. Um, great Scottish tune by a uh, modern composition by a Scottish band. Um, if I, what's it called? Were I to cross. place of worship, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with each one of you now and forevermore. Amen.